Welcome to the Why Did I Get Cancer podcast. I'm Deborah Herlax Enos, a small town girl turned TV nutritionist and healthy living expert. I design health programs for the average guy or gal, including those average guys named Metallica. On September 1st, 2020, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I asked every oncologist the same question, why did I get cancer? But none of my doctors had good answers for me. I wanted answers and that's why I started this podcast. I wanna help you to lower your cancer risk and provide self-care tips for those in the battle. I'm getting answers and I wanna share them with you. Today's conversation with Dr. Stephen Hussey really challenged me in in a lot of good ways, but also some ways where I know I'm going to have to take a deeper dive. Um, He's the author of two books. One is Understanding the Heart, and the other one is The Health Evolution, Why Is There So Much Chronic Disease in Our World? Now, to backtrack, when he was writing the book about heart health, he had a heart attack at 34 years old in the middle of writing that book. We talked a lot about why he had a heart attack at that young of an age. For him, it was very stress-related, so we unpack that. But we also talked about why are people so sick today? He said, we have gone from working in fields to now working behind a desk all day where we're um, in unnatural lighting and exposed to a lot of blue light. We talked about the blue light that comes off of computers and laptops and phones. And he was saying there was a really interesting study done on mice. And what they found was that um, when they put the blue light on mice within a year, they ended up with skin cancer. So there is so much to unpack as to how we used to live to how we live now. And then Dr. Hesse had a lot of really great tips of, okay, so you live in a high rise, here's how you can be healthier. You live on you know, a farm, it's going to be a little bit easier, but how can we learn to hack our health? Um, we also talk about structured water, which is something that I knew next to nothing about. I actually asked him, can you buy structured water at the supermarket? <laughs> no. The short answer is no, it's in your body, it's part of your blood, it's part of your cells, and having more structured water will make you a healthier person. So we talked also about things that that kill structured water in your body and things that create more structured water. Um, I hope you listen to this podcast. Honestly, he is a wealth of information and uh, fastened your seatbelts. It was a good one. Well, welcome to Why Did I Get Cancer, Dr. Stephen Hussey. And um, I first heard you on my friend Hilda Labrador's podcast. And I had so many questions because you talked about your heart attack at 34, which is so shocking as you were in the middle of writing a book about heart disease. Uh, you talked about structured water, um, the evolution of you know why we're getting chronic disease. As a breast cancer survivor and thriver, I cannot wait for this conversation, especially talking about inflammation. But again, welcome to Why Did I Get Cancer? Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, Well, let's kind of jump into the deep end of the pool. And why are we all so sick? I think to put kind of like a 10,000 foot view on it, um, you know, my first book, The Health Evolution, that's what I tried to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. This kind of big picture understanding of why are we suffering from chronic disease in the epidemic that we are that, you know, 100, 200 years ago, we didn't have. Um, Right. And so what's happened and in that book, I talk a lot about evolution uh, in the Darwinian sense. Uh, and there's people that, you know, think that Darwin got it not completely correct. Um, but the idea that, you know, certain either mutations that give an advantage um, or just, you know, like being taller or shorter or whatever, um, those types of things give people an advantage. And that over time, like life you know, the, the environment that your body's in selects for that advantage. And that's how evolution happened. That's how we become what we are today. Mm -hmm. But the, so that, you know, that can take many, many years. And that's the, that's the issue is that this process of evolution, you're never going to see in a lifetime or 10 lifetimes, Mm -hmm. right? It takes many, many generations. So the, the, I guess, example is there's a scientist in Russia named Dmitry Belyev who selectively breeded foxes. Um, which have a much shorter gestation cycle than humans and other animals. But he selectively breeded them for like uh, domestic type traits. You know, the ones that were more likely to come up to him and be more friendly with him, he selectively breeded those. And it took him about 
you know, 30 generations before he started seeing like actual characteristics change. And then it took him 50 generations before he had like basically a fox that was acting like a dog, you know, and like wow. domesticated. Okay. Uh, so it takes a long time and that's very select breeding, which doesn't happen in nature. So the point is, is that it takes a very long time for evolution to adapt any species to a change. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you look at what has happened, like if you look at the amount of time that humans have been here, um, the first evidence that we have is maybe 300,000 years ago when modern humans were here, but even, there, right. even then there was pre-humans that were here for millions of years before that. If you look at how long we've been here and then how long we've been living a certain type of way, it's way too fast, you know, mm -hmm. for evolution to have changed and made us adapted to our modern day environments. And so we can get into like the details of that, but it's, it's like the environment has changed enough that it's not just killing us. Cause you know, like if you put a polar bear in Hawaii, it's probably not going to thrive very well. Yeah. Right. If you put a polar bear on Mars, it's not going to survive at all. Right. So, mm -hmm. so Mars is too much of a change. That's going to kill it right instantly. And that's not what's happening with us. We're more like the polar bear that's in Hawaii, hmm. you know, and it's very struggling. It's struggling um, quite a bit to maintain health, right? It may survive, especially yeah. if its life is made easy, like the conveniences we have of modern day life. Right. Um, but it's going to struggle and it's going to suffer from disease. And that's exactly what's happened in the last, say, 10 to 15,000 years, which sounds like a very long time. But evolutionarily, like if you think about that, like 10 to 15,000 years ago, humans started agriculture and agriculture, you know, you know, staying in one place, harvesting crops, developing civilizations, that type of thing. That's a very new thing for us, because if you look at the amount of time that humans have been here and you put that amount of time into a 24 hour clock, mm -hmm. agriculture started at 1154 PM, you know, so like the last uh -huh. six minutes of the day, that very small amount of time we've been living in civilizations with agriculture, eating agricultural type foods. And then even more recently, uh, we've had uh, changes in light environment, uh, right. changes in toxin exposure, change in, uh, changes in activity, moving from like working the fields and being outside more to sitting behind desks, behind artificial light. Like, and that's a very recent change. Um, mm -hmm. So all these changes have happened more and more recently. And there's no way that our physiology could have adapted to it. And so that's why we're seeing it. So when you study what causes chronic disease, which is why I've kind of dedicated my life to, yeah. you realize that these changes, like this artificial food, the toxin exposure, the inactivity, the artificial light exposure, these are the things that are driving chronic diseases. And this is not a theory. You go into PubMed and you type in disrupted circadian rhythm. And there's literally an article research about that and any chronic disease you could think of or artificial processed foods and any chronic disease you can think of. Like this is, this is the thing is so that's how you kind of explain this big picture of why we're so sick today, but it also illuminates the path of how to get, how we go forward, you know? So it sounds like you're saying that it's not just one thing. It's not just, you know, agriculture or, um, you know, eating ultra processed foods. It's kind of this trifecta, if not more items, you know, from the artificial light to the sedentary, that's all working against us. Yeah. It's, it's very multifactorial. There's, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of disease is almost, almost never caused by one thing. Hmm. Um, even if there was one incident that seemed to like happen, that your disease happened after that, there was probably many things that kind of, like you could say, you could think of it like a metaphorical bucket. You know, everybody has a bucket and if the bucket overflows, you're going to get a disease process. Mm -hmm. um, and so just because, you know, there's something happened that you think caused the whole disease process doesn't mean that the bucket was teetering on overflowing. And then that last thing you put in there that caused it was the thing. But there's so many things in the buckets you could have done beforehand right. um, to make that last thing that caused the disease, you know, not be the cause of disease. So we have to think about all the different things we can get out of our bucket. Yeah. And you'd mentioned um, a few minutes ago about, you know, it, it kind of illuminates a path forward, seeing all these multifactorial issues. So how does somebody start? Yeah. Well, you know, and it, it can get really confusing in the health world today because there's so many, you know, quote unquote experts and, mm, and influencers so out there that are telling us all different things. Right. Um, and so, and, and lots of times I feel like many of those experts are very lost in the weeds of research. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying that research is bad or that we shouldn't listen to it or that we shouldn't gain knowledge from it um, or that it's not useful. But I am saying that that shouldn't be the only thing that you base your lifestyle decisions on. And I can make a very good argument against research and against like all the flaws. I mean, it's human designed. It's mm -hmm. human created. This idea that's even the hierarchy of research is human created. So there's, it's fundamentally flawed. But 
that doesn't mean that we can't learn from it. We we've learned a ton from it. We've gained a lot of information from it, but you always have to apply that information in the context of logic and, and human history uh, yeah. and the history of life, right? So if there's something the research is telling you that doesn't make sense to me, you know, that there's a molecule in my body that's causing heart disease and mm -hmm. it's called cholesterol, right? If the research is telling me that, that doesn't make sense to me because yeah. Cholesterol has been present in the blood of humans and all life forever. Forever, um, yeah. You know, and and humans were eating meat, and that's literally there's evidence that that's made us human. Yeah. Right. Like eating meat and then cooking meat made us human. So, if if the eating the cholesterol, or eating meat, and eating very low carb raises my cholesterol, that doesn't. I mean, that's likely what it was for our ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, and we've only been measuring cholesterol in the context of a of a population that has been eating a very processed food, high carbohydrate diet. So how do we know it's not normal for humans to have higher cholesterol? Um, and right. we don't. And so, that, so those types of things, you have to apply it to that kind of thing. You have to apply it into the context of that. So if, if there's research telling you that sunlight is causing skin cancer, that doesn't make sense to me because the mm -hmm. sun has been around. It is literally the, the energy source for all things on earth. Right. Uh, it doesn't make sense that it's also killing you. Right. Um, or, and, and if you look at the research that they've done to say, oh, the sunlight's causing skin cancer, what they do is they use isolated UVB or UV lamps mm -hmm. uh, and they put that on skin or they put that on animals or whatever. And they say, oh, look, it causes skin cancer. But like that is never the way it is in natural sunlight. It's always balanced by UVA, um, right. uh, infrared, all the colors of light. So it doesn't make sense. So we have to take all that research in the context of, you know, logic and history of humans and use that to guide our health behaviors. But ultimately what that tells us is that we've created a modern way of life that has moved us too far, um, just far enough away from the actual environment that humans are supposed to be in, mm -hmm. that it's causing disease processes, causing diseases to strike us earlier in life um, and those types of things. And so we have yeah. to move ourselves within the confines of our modern way of life, move ourselves back more toward that natural environment of humans, which is outside in nature, eating real food, having real relationships under natural light, all this type of stuff. Um, that's so like when you, when you ask yourself the question and you're, you think you're listening to influencers and information out there, just ask yourself that question. Is this moving me more back toward where humans were before we had all these modern conveniences and, and ways of life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, so it sounds like uh, you are hoping people rely on common sense. Yeah. At some point it boils down <laughs> yeah, to that. It really you know? does. I mean, that's, so how did your great grandparents live? I mean, mine were farmers and sheep herders. And so they were outside all the time and they lived to, you know, well into their nineties and pretty good health. So why did I get cancer, you know, at 55? Why did you have a heart attack at 34? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Those are the questions that, you know, I was forced to ask, obviously, when mm -hmm. that happened. Yeah. I mean, I, I talk about my example specifically, because uh, mm -hmm. people are probably wondering that. You yeah, know, 34 please do. years old. You right. Know? So at that time, I was going through a lot of stress. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also type one diabetic. I have been since I was nine years old, which inspired my curiosity about the heart and the vascular system because type ones are heavily predisposed to heart disease. So okay. I'd already done a, a lot of research on this beforehand. And yes, to, you know, to my surprise, I, you know, at, at 34, um, I'd heard like probably some of the most stressful news in my life a day and a half before this happened. And I probably unwisely did my usual intense workout, mm -hmm. um, a day and a half later on that Tuesday morning. Um, and about 20 minutes later had a heart attack, um, a hundred percent blockage of my left anterior descending artery. But Wow. When they went in, um, so I had a CAC score, uh, which we talked about a little bit off air, yeah. um, six months prior to this, and it was zero. There was no calcified plaque in my arteries. Um, and when they went in to place the stint after, while I was having the heart attack, they found no soft plaque in my arteries. They just found a clot, a giant clot that formed huh? in my left anterior descending artery, which is the most common place for it to happen. Okay. And so, you know, obviously I was pretty demoralized and pretty shocked and no wondering kidding. what the heck was going on or why that happened. Um, but, you know, like I said, I'd already looked into heart disease a lot and I had already kind of, you know, found all the evidence and logic and everything behind this idea that cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Mm -hmm. If you look at the history of that idea and that theory, which it is just a theory that really doesn't have any sound science behind it. If you look at that, then you're like, well, this is not what causes heart disease. Yeah. Yet when I asked physicians in the hospital, because at that point I was like, okay, 
you know, hands up, like okay, what, what happened? Right. All they would say you're, is you're seeking answers. Yeah. Yeah. And they would just say, well, your cholesterol is high. Cholesterol causes heart attacks. And I was just like, okay. And so I would ask the next, you know, physician, the next attending that would come in and they'd say the same yeah. thing. And it didn't really, it, there was no real conversation about it, you know, despite me, you know, pushing back a little bit, not in an aggressive way, just being like, well, what about this or that? And they would just mm -hmm. say, nope, this is what does it. We want you on these five medications the rest of your life. Um, and this is what you do. They, yeah. they came in and they told me, okay, eat this processed food diet. Literally, they gave me a list of what I should eat. <laughs> and it was processed foods. There was of like vegetable is. oils were on there. Fig uh. Newtons were on there cookies, animal crackers, like cereal. that was okay. Yeah. Cause yeah, cereal is approved okay by the American Heart Association. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. lean meats were the only meats uh, I was allowed to have, you know? Oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, it was, they, it was that kind of stuff. And I was just like, okay. So that three days in the hospital, which is much shorter than most people would spend in the hospital after a heart mm -hmm. attack. Um, you know, they were, it reinvigorated me and I was like, okay, this I'll is just wrong. Right. Yeah. This is, and there's, and it's not just wrong because of my opinion or my logic is like the research doesn't reflect what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of made it my mission to kind of share this story. But what happened in my heart attack was a clot formed, right? And so when I looked into it deeper, that's what atherosclerosis is. It's not this accumulation of cholesterol. There's no evidence for that. Um, you know, atherosclerosis happens when there's damage to the lining of an artery. And when there's damage from many different things, which we can talk about if you want, then a clot forms. And if it's slow, chronic damage over time, then it's atherosclerosis. It's just plaque forming on arteries, but it's clotting tissue. And when you analyze plaque, it's clotting tissue. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the research, it says that platelets or fibrinogen, which are clotting factors, they modulate atherosclerosis uh, in every single part of it. Um, and so clotting was the issue. Um, and a pathologic clot formed in the artery in the body that's under the most pressure of any artery of any artery in the body. So, mm -hmm. um, that's where it most likely happens, but it does happen in other places. Obviously we get strokes and kidney infarcts and yep. DVTs and things like that. Um, but that's what happened in that coronary artery for me. And so then I went on this quest to figure out, well, how do we stop clotting from happening or pathologic clotting? Because yeah. clotting is supposed to happen sometimes. It is. Yeah. Um, and that's normal, but your body's supposed to be able to break it down if it's too much, um, mm -hmm. and just kind of heal the area and time. regulate like, it. Yeah. Yeah. And regulate mm -hmm. it. Um, and so, you know, what I found is that structured water in the body, um, which is, you know, water has the ability to hold energy and when it does, and it gets next to biological surfaces, it actually structures itself mm -hmm. into more of a gel. It's not a solid liquid gas. It's more like the consistency of jello or raw egg white, mm -hmm. um, and this is something that scientists over the last hundred years have discovered many different times. So it's got many different names because lots of scientists discovered it at many times. Okay. Um, so they call it exclusion zone water or structured water or fourth phase water um, or EZ or bound water, different things. Um, but this phenomenon does happen. And, the, and most of the work today is being done in the lab of Dr. Gerald Pollack at University of Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and so this does indeed happen in the vascular system we get structured water formation on the lining of the artery because the blood is about half water. And so that water forms on the lining of the artery. And it turns out that um, it does a lot of beneficial things for us in that sense um, that help us prevent clotting, which again mm. is what heart attacks, strokes, atherosclerosis is. It's pathologic clotting tissue. And so if you look at what causes clotting, you know, Rudolf Virchow back in 1856 said that um, you know, what causes clotting is damage to the lining of the artery. Um, when we get poor stagnant blood flow and when we get elements of blood that get too sticky and clumped together. Mm -hmm. And so those things cause clotting and that still holds true in medicine today. That's what's recognized Virchow's triad. Um, and so if you look at what structured water does, when it forms on the lining of the artery, um, it it's called exclusion zone water because it's this almost impenetrable barrier. Nothing okay. can really penetrate it. So what does that do? It protects the lining of the artery. Yeah. Um, and there's studies that show that when you build structured water on the artery, you increase endothelial health and they increase nitric oxide, nitric oxide production, which is mm. a marker of endothelial health. Right. And so that's number one for Josh Chad, number one. The second thing is, is that they found that when structured water forms, it, it's very electronegatively charged. And because it cleaves off a high, one of the hydrogens of water, one of those mm -hmm. hydrogens is left in the middle. So we get a very negative area next to a collection of positive area. Mm -hmm. And that's a battery. Sure and is. So, yeah. And they've shown that you can actually put an electrode into the positive and negative area and power a light bulb. 
And so this structured water. <laughs> wow. Is that is really cool. Yeah. Okay. And in this case, in the tube, in a tube, that battery does the work of moving fluid. And they've done this experiment over and over again in Dr. Pollock's lab. So that's how blood is moved in the body uh, for the most part. Wow. Um, the heart does a little bit of pumping, but mainly the blood moves by these mechanisms. And they've shown this, they've stopped the heart of chick embryos and they've shown the blood continues to move. Um, because of this, this battery that our body has created with structured water. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that is, I, it doesn't the body just geek you out sometimes. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. It's, it's crazy. What it's it fascinating. Can do. Yeah. And it's amazing. Um, and learning about it like learning about structured water, not just in the vascular system, but in the body in general, mm -hmm. explains so many things for me. Um, huh. But then the last thing is that all the elements of blood, red blood cells, lipoproteins, you know, the cholesterol, um, mm -hmm. they are also surrounded by structured water, or they should be. And that structured water that gives them a negative charge, that negative charge is called zeta potential. Yeah. Um, so they've shown this in many studies. Um, and that zeta potential, we have a negatively charged thing and like charges to repel each other. If they get too close, they don't stick together. So if we talk about keeping elements of blood from sticking together, we want structured water in on those elements of blood. And so structured water, if we do that in the body, then it prevents those three things that cause Virchow's tribe, which is, um, which is clotting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it protects the lining of the artery. It keeps blood moving and stops it from being stagnant and it keeps the elements of blood from sticking together. And so that's exactly what I was missing. I have rejected this idea that cholesterol causes heart disease. So I was, you know, wasn't worried about that, um, but I didn't replace it with something else. And that's what Thomas Kuhn says. He's like to reject a theory without replacing it with another is to reject science itself. <laughs> um, and so that's what I did. And yeah, so I quote. ended up in this stressful situation and was not doing the things that build structured water. And it happened, it, a heart attack happened and I survived. Very fortunate, very thankful for the care team that mm. did that. Um, and I feel like it, it, it was my reasoning to push this message forward. Like it was like, this is why I'm here. This is why it happened. Um, and so everybody's probably asking at this point, well, what builds structured water? That's like, right. How do, how do we do that? Right. Where can we buy it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the thing is, is you don't have to buy it. Yeah. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about this. And it, and it goes right back into what we just talked about as far as bringing your body back to nature. Um, because the things that build structured water are sunlight, radiant energy, uh, um, grounding, uh, gentle movement or stretching of the body, you know, all these things. So that's so the environment, right? That's the yeah. environment that we've removed ourselves from. We've taken ourselves away from the ground. We're living indoors. Mm -hmm. uh, under artificial light. Uh, we're away from the sunlight. We've been told it's bad for us. It causes skin cancer. Yep. We're not moving. We're sitting behind desks uh, all day long under all that artificial light. And so if you look at, you know, the, the trend of heart disease, coronary heart disease, like atherosclerosis, when that happened, everybody's wanting to attribute it to our changes in diet, which is definitely a problem because mm -hmm. processed foods are inflammatory, yep. you know, but what has really happened is we've removed ourselves from sunlight exposure, which is what's to charge our bodies, charge our structured water. Hmm. And that correlates directly from when we started fluorescent lighting and moved indoors in the fifties, which is when heart, heart disease was rising. Um, and we, then we had LEDs invented in the 1970s and then we're really pushed into the environment and uh, into our homes in the early two thousands. Um, you know, then that, that shift there has really, the trend has gone way up in heart disease. Right. And it's kind of stabilized a little wow. bit. But that combined with the processed food, combined with the inactivity, mm -hmm. like that right there. And so if you ask me, you know, heart disease, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular type condition um, is largely driven by lack of sunlight exposure. Um, so wow. yeah. that is and a then, and then the crazy food concept, diet, crazy yeah. concept. Yes. And then the processed food diet is just fuel to the fire once that yeah. happens. And the other aspect of that is circadian rhythm, because mm -hmm. if you damage the lining of the artery, you damage those endothelial, cell, endothelial cells, the process that triggers for the healing and repair of those endothelial cells is one, insulin signaling. So if mm -hmm. we're metabolically unhealthy, then that doesn't happen. And two, it's our circadian rhythm. So every night we're supposed to clean house, repair, that kind yep. of thing. And so if we're not sleeping well, we don't make enough mel melatonin, even if we do sleep, then we're not getting that cleaning house mechanism. And so our arteries never get the repair signal 
to 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 cleanse themselves. So um, those things are just once the damage has happened, then your body can't recover from it because the artificial light is disrupting your circadian rhythm. Like it all just fits so nicely together. It's just and it's just logical. Like when the research you look at and all the evidence you see matches up with your philosophy and your logic, you're just like, man, this is it. And then here's the kicker is that people think this is maybe just a theory of mine. Mm -hmm. um, but after I had the heart attack, I developed atherosclerosis in my leg because of where they went in with the, oh, right. where they went into the artery in my leg yep. to go and place this thing in my heart. There was a device they used that kind of clumped that up. Um, and so then it, it messed with the flow dynamics into my leg and I developed atherosclerosis and they tried to tell me that doesn't happen, but I've talked to many, many people, um, who've had this done and that's exactly mm -hmm. what happened to them too. Mm -hmm. And so I had a 75 to 99% blockage of the artery in my leg. I couldn't Ooh. walk without pain in my lower leg. I couldn't, of course. definitely couldn't snowboard or play soccer or whatever. And so at the time they decided they weren't going to do anything about it because it wasn't affecting my day to day. I just couldn't do some of the things I liked. And they said, when you start messing with it, then it gets worse. Um, anyways, I did my routine. I learned some of this stuff and I did my routine. I said, okay, I'm going to get more sunlight. I'm going to get an infrared sauna, which infrared light is the most building the structured water. I'm going to start more yoga. I'm going to do more grounding and I'm going to optimize my circadian rhythm. And that's what I started to do probably four months, uh, three to four months after I had the heart attack. Mm -hmm. And a year later, that atherosclerosis in my leg uh, was reduced to 50%. And then a year after that, it was completely normal. Oh my um, gosh. And then Massive a year after reset. that, yeah. yeah um, a year after that, I just got it tested, which is last May. Um, this last May, it was still normal. And so the vascular surgeon said, well, we can't say it's better because we don't see these things get better. That's where exact words to me. And I was okay. like, well, you just saw it get better, you know, like, and maybe you don't in the context of what you tell people and what you see people are doing. Right. But it clearly did get better. Why are you not curious? Why are you yeah. not saying, well, how did this happen? Let me investigate this. You know, right. it was He's, just, okay, they well, just good witnessed for you. a miracle. So wouldn't you want to know like some of the details of the miracle so you could pass yeah. it along to your other patients? Yeah. And further my heart, which the ejection fraction had decreased because there was some damage and the tissue in my heart had been damaged. or so wasn't conducting the signal very well. Mm -hmm. Those things completely recovered. Um, really? Yeah. So my heart is pretty much normal again. Uh, there may be some slight scar tissue, but it's conducting signal very well. Um, and injection fraction is normal. So, um, Ooh. yeah, it's, it's kind of craziness, but it goes to show that like, it's not just theory. It's like, it's there's literature behind this, theory. right? There's logic behind it. Like it makes sense from a human perspective, evolutionarily, historically, and I did it. Um, yeah. so it, I did it using that cause I didn't change anything else. Here's the thing is my stress was about the same. It may have even got worse at some point during those two years that I did it. Mm -hmm. My diet stayed the same. It was low carb. My, uh, and then when it was low carb, my cholesterol gets high quote unquote, which you could yep. argue there's no such thing mine, as that. Mine too. Um, yep. Yeah. And so with like my LDLs were anywhere from, uh, 200 to 372 during that two years. So that's well above what's recommended to be. And I reversed well atherosclerosis yeah. while that was that way. So okay. there's more to it than that. We there's gotta, we gotta look so deeper. There's so much more to it. Okay, I don't know what the weather's like where you are, but I am telling you, it is getting cold here in Washington. I feel like we're gonna have an early winter and I think it's actually happening. So I hope I didn't prophesy that. But anyway, as winter starts to happen, I transitioned from eating salads and raw foods to eating more savory, warm and savory and salty and all the things kinds of food because I get cold in the winter like a lot of you and eating warmer foods feels like it just fuels my energy and makes me feel better. So this is how I'm transitioning. Instead of salads, I'm now doing more veggie bowls. So I often will take ground beef. It's easy to keep in your freezer, defrost fairly quickly, and then I'll cook it up. I'll put rice on the bottom of the bowl. I'll have a lot of roasted vegetables on top of that, and then a little bit of um, the ground beef on top. 
little drizzle of olive oil or vinegar and oil and you have got yourself the most fabulous meal. If you want to get fancy, crumble a little feta cheese and maybe chop some parsley on top. Your stomach will thank you. And my friends at ButcherBox are making this really easy for you to do by offering my community $30 off of your first box. I'm just going to stop right there and tell you they're not doing that for anybody else. Go ahead and do an online search. You're going to realize they're so good to me. So you get $30 off of your first box. And then bonus, you get free choose your own protein in every box for up to a year. And so the choose your own protein, you get a choice of wild Alaskan salmon. Honestly, who doesn't love that? Lots of recipes on my blog if you want to see how I cook it. The grass fed, grass finished ground beef or chicken breast, which I make a lot of chicken noodle soup in the winter. And then I just freeze it in single serving sizes. And um, it's just a great, easy, super easy dinner that I just have to defrost. So go to butcherbox.com forward slash Enos, use the code Enos, get this great deal. So what you're saying is your, your process was fairly simple yeah. and quite honestly, enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're yeah. talking about getting up and walking on your grass in the morning, mm -hmm. get a little more sunlight, some movement. And, and you didn't say, oh, I went to the gym five days a week and did a HIIT workout. You said mm -hmm. gentle movement mm -hmm. was helpful, right? Yeah. Well, this, the compression or stretching of fascia actually creates what's called a piezoelectric effect. And the piezoelectric effect is created by structured water forming on the collagen fibers of our fascia. And when you stretch that and you compress or stretch it, so like when you get a massage or someone's pushing into you, that yeah. compression will do it. But also the stretching of it, gentle stretching of it um, will do it as well. It creates this piezoelectric effect, which creates uh, electrons. Uh, and those electrons are they streamed through the collagen to different tissues of the body. Um, and that's what it all is. Like you talked about inflammation. Inflammation is just basically what I call low body charge. Some people call it oxidative stress. Some mm. people call it inflammation. To me, it's low body charge. And what holds our charge, our net negative charge of electrons is structured water. It's the, it's like, we're like a friend of mine says this often. She says that it's, we are structured water batteries charged by the sun. That's what we are. That's what drives wow. our processes. You know, if we need energy to do things, we need that structured water battery to be charged. Yeah. And we need the sun to do that. If you take away the charge, you start to tend toward disorder. Those are the laws of the universe, the thermodynamic laws of the universe that yeah. energy is not created or destroyed. It's just transferred from one entity to another. So from the sun to other things mm -hmm. or us, um, and that things tend toward disorder. In order to create order, you need energy to yep. organize things temporarily while something is alive to create order. And that's what we are. If we're tending toward disorder, we're getting disease. Yeah. And so we need energy to create order. And when you remove your energy source, which is the sun or contact with the earth, which that energy is also from the sun mm -hmm. um, or harvesting the energy from the chemical bonds in food that is from mm. the sun. Um, mm -hmm. All of this, we're all just trying to get energy so that we can maintain order. And the more we maintain order, the less disease that we have. And so removing ourselves, there's no way we could adapt to less energy, you know, mm -hmm. um, removing ourselves from that environment. So we have to go back. We can't eat processed foods. Uh, we can't divorce ourselves from the sun. We can't avoid the ground. We can't have toxic relationships, artificial light, electromagnetic yep. fields, like all these things. Like look at our environments and you're like, hmm, no wonder we're sick. Toxic yeah. exposure. Um, it's it makes sense. It does make sense. And it and it and all these things that you're talking about are basically free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there are there are people that don't want you to know that. They want to sell you stuff. They do, um, which that's they the wanna, nature of they capitalist They want to sell society. the cure, right? They want to yeah. sell the cure. And you know, yeah. there are some things you can buy. Like I bought an infrared sauna. So, mm -hmm. you know, which is very helpful for in increasing, uh, therapeutically my infrared light exposure, which infrared is the most structuring to water it builds, but all wavelengths of light will do it. Um, and so that was helpful. I also have like my feet are on a grounding mat right now. So yep. plugged into the grounding prong and I have grounding sheets on my bed. Yep, um, same. Like a yep. EMF blocking canopy. So there's some things that aren't free, you know, yeah. but lots of things you can do are completely free. So you don't need to right. be super rich to do this. You can just you go don't. outside yeah. um, and, and depending on where you live, do that year round. And, and it's just, even if, even if you live somewhere cold, you can still do it year round, you know, there are benefits to cold exposure. So there's all That's these different true. things. You just have to be willing to do it. You have to kind of, you know, devote, you know, 
uh, that time and that effort to yourself um, mm -hmm. to keep yourself healthy. So you bring up a good point about sun. And I know you went to school in the Pacific Northwest, which is where I live now. And we don't get a lot of sun for seven to eight months a year. Can this still work with me going outside and it's kind of a rainy, drizzly day? And mm -hmm. um, how does the sun exposure work at that point? Yeah. So, you know, we're all living in different areas of the world mm -hmm. um, today, whereas in reality, in the past, yeah, we didn't really travel that far. I'm talking about right. very, very distant past, you know. Um, so where your where your ancestors are from is the is kind of the color of your skin is really associated with the light environment that you were in. If you live near the equator, you probably have darker skin. Um, you know, you're you're absorbing a lot of melanin or a lot of sunlight through melanin. Um, whereas if you're um, lived away, farther away from the equator where there was less sun, like for me, you know, Northern, Northern Europe, um, Irish, Scandinavian type thing, um, then there's a lot less sun. And so your body has lighter skin to absorb as much sun as possible. Uh, so you have to kind of acknowledge that, uh, based on your skin color, your skin color, your ancestry and where you live today, because we live in different environments all over the place, all over the world. Um, and so, but that doesn't mean that the skin, the sun is bad for us. Um, and then for places like the Pacific Northwest, where it's, it's cloudy a lot, um, you have to optimize those summer, those summer months. There's like three months in the Northwest where it stays <laughs> more right. sunny and it's yep. warm enough that you can go outside and do that. And you build up, you know, the storage of that energy. Mm -hmm. And then as much as you can try and, um, try and get out there in the winter too, because even though like the UVB is not as high, uh, there's still UV light in the midday. It's just not as much. Um, and you want to get as much of that as you can. And so then there's other things you can do. Like if, if you do that and you generally stay healthy, then, okay, that's good enough, you know? Yeah. But if not, if you're still suffering, you know, or you're still, um, you know, struggling with that, then there are things you could do. Like you get an infrared sauna and that can help boost your infrared. Okay. You know, you could get red light or infrared light panels or things like that. You could get, um, vitamin D lamps. Um, to help you, um, that kind of stuff. I, people oftentimes say, well, we can just take vitamin D in the winter and, you know, vitamin D is a steroid hormone. Um, it's not technically a vitamin. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about it like that. You're taking a hormone, um, which lots of times people say, if you don't, if you don't need the hormone then don't take it, or it can mess with other hormones. Um, and I would advise, against taking really high amounts of it or relying on that. I would much rather you get like a UV lamp, um, mm -hmm. a vitamin D lamp. Um, okay. And because a few reasons, one um, is that the process of making vitamin D also makes metabolites that your body uses for very important other things. So if you don't, if you just give your body vitamin D, it doesn't, the process of making it doesn't happen. So to make it, you need cholesterol, sulfur, and sunlight. Um, you need those things. So you, you have to have those. Um, and secondly, we're talking about hormone imbalances. We're talking about the body down regulating mechanisms to make it and kind of losing those. Um, so, so then when you do get sunlight, you don't make as much and it takes your body, your body a while to start doing that again. Kind of like if you, um, you know, uh, people who do really low carb for a long time and then right. they have some sugar and it looks like they have pathologic sugar response, but they don't really They have a physiologic Mm -hmm. um, adaptation, physiologic insulin resistance. Um, and it just take like a day or two for them to get back to that. So to kind of normalize. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, things okay. like that. So, so yeah, you know, we have to kind of do the best we can in the context of where we live. Now, what about right. that? What about someone who lives at the equator? Who's from Scandinavia and they're like, I'm the palest person in the world. <laughs> I'm going to burn, you know, I'm going right. to get skin cancer or whatever. And like I said, the studies on skin cancer and UV light are pretty flawed. Um, there's no way that, or there's no time ever that just UVB comes from the sun. It's always balanced by everything else. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of very interesting studies. Um, so there's studies that show that the people, and this was a worldwide study, looked at people who got more sunlight had less rates of melanoma, melanoma so more UVB exposure. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, they found that the there was an inverse for like lack of UVB and there was increased melanoma. Um, wow. They also found that um, there was a study that found that uh, you could, people with melanoma already, 
the more UVB light they got, the less likely they were to die from melanoma. Um, there's studies that show or that have shown that um, artificial blue light, uh, so LED bulbs and fluorescent right. lighting and those types of cell phones. screens, cell phones, yeah, yeah that those things um, induce the changes in skin cells that cause damage that lead to skin cancer. They were actually able to mm -hmm. induce skin cancer in mice just using exposing them to artificial blue light over a year. Um, Ooh, so, that is really scary. Yeah. And they looked at another study of people in the Navy, um, looked at people who had indoor jobs versus outdoor jobs. Mm -hmm. and the people who had outdoor jobs had way less rates of skin cancer than mm -hmm. the indoor jobs. Um, and those are just associations. But curiously, the places, the people who did get cancer, who had the indoor jobs, the places that they got cancer were the places where they usually you get less sunlight exposure, like on the abdomen, on yeah. the core and the chest. Right. It wasn't on the arms and the face where they got it. It was on those places. Um, so, and there's studies that show fascinating that yeah. the imbalance, like too much UVA light and too little with too little UVB mm -hmm. uh, induces balance. skin cancer. And mm -hmm. guess what does that? Modern windows, modern windows <sighs> filter out the UVB, but let in the UVA. So here we are living behind modern uh, windows and that imbalance has been shown to create the causes or the changes that cause skin cancer. So that's what's, that's what's causing skin cancer. And then the other thing is, yeah. is that, well, sunscreen's toxic, right? There's toxins yeah. in there. So that's going to talk, put toxins in the skin. But what else is sunscreen doing? It's blocking UVB mm -hmm. and we're letting in UVA, you know, so that no UVB letting in the UVA, that, that imbalance has mm -hmm. been shown to cause skin cancer. So that's, that's what's doing it in my opinion. Um, based on that literature, uh, right. and based on the fact, again, go back to our original conversation, what makes sense humans what and all life sense? has been in the sun, our entire, we lived outside hundred percent of the time, right? There was no was, sunscreens. Yeah, there yeah. was, yeah. And now all yeah. of a sudden it's killing us. That doesn't make sense. There it must be something else, sense. right? Now it's not ideal to burn. Mm -hmm. That's not fun. Right. But if you, if you sink your body up to the day night cycle, and you get sunlight exposure throughout the year, you tell your body what time of year it is, you tell it to be ready for more intense sun exposure. Like if mm -hmm. you tell it early in the day when the sun has risen, instead of just waiting for it to be warm enough in, in the year, and then waiting for it to be warm enough during the day and just go straight out into the midday sun, your body's like, yeah. ah, we didn't, we weren't ready for this. Right. Then you're going to burn. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas like I'm super pale, but I'm, it may not look like it, but I'm the tannest I've ever been right now. And I can stay <laughs> out for like an hour and a half and not burn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at middle of the day. So it's, you have to build up that tolerance that, that what they call solar callus, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. And I, I've read a lot of those studies and mm. you know, they're fascinating. They are fascinating, mm. but I didn't know that about windows that it allows in the UVA, but blocks the, the B. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That really makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So, um, on the structured water, you talked about being really stressed when, right before you got, you had really bad news, the worst news of your life, 48 hours before your heart attack. Does stress kill structured water? Uh, well, there's, there's evidence that negative emotion okay. definitely will. Okay. Um, so the work of Mario Suyamoto, um, you know, shows that if you express negative emotions to water, when you freeze it, it freezes like all, um, you know, not well, not like not symmetrical, um, mm -hmm. kind of fragmented, um, not like a usual ice crystal would look, but if you express like positive emotions or gratitude or things to water and then freeze it, it forms perfectly symmetrical, beautiful snowflakes. So yep. there's some effect there. There's some yeah. effect to water. Do we know it exactly what it is? No, but there's some effect. And so ice yeah. is basically, you know, it, it's the same kind of like structural formation as structured water, but it's just without the other extra hydrogen. So ice is just all that water frozen together in that same hexagonal pattern. Whereas structured water is just the oxygen and hydrogen that form the hexagonal pattern. So it makes it yeah. more of a gel. Um, and so, you know, we can assume, and we're assuming a little bit, um, that, you know, negative emotions will interfere with structured water formation uh, or impact its ability to do that. But there are things that have scientifically been shown to interfere with structured water formation. One of them is glyphosate which is oh, the herbicide Roundup. Goodness, um, which really? Which you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot right now and buy if you want to do it. I know, you against still, it. yeah. I just, got, um, I just did a glyphosate test and I'm in the 95th percentile. 
Mm -hmm. I have so much glyphosate in my body, which I am working with my doctor to get it out. But I grew up on a farm. Yeah. In the 70s. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. It is yeah, crazy. So that has been shown to reduce it. Um, okay. A wireless router has been shown to reduce structured water formation. Okay. Um, so those are the things we've got to work out, watch out for. So these, um, these non-native electromagnetic fields that mm. we're not used to being exposed to, again, very different than what we were exposed to, which the only electromagnetic field we were exposed to was the earth and other living things. Right. Um, yeah, these other ones, these new ones are not compatible and they affect the structured water. So in anything that you can think about, oh, it's, you can say that it's inflammatory, right? Because what holds our net negative charge that keeps us uninflamed? Structured water. If there's anything mm -hmm. that interferes with that, we can call it inflammatory because it's decreasing our net negative charge, making us more acidic, more inflamed, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, those are the things that can interfere with it. So we build it, infrared light, right. grounding, movement, that type of stuff, um, positive emotions. We, we avoid the things that tear it down, glyphosate, other toxins, I'm sure too. That's just the one that's been scientifically tested. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wireless signals, negative thoughts, negative energy, that type of thing. It sounds like you're talking about a really pleasant way to live, you know, <laughs> turning exactly. off the news, um, you know, eating organic, maybe even growing some of your own food, uh, being out in the sun. It sounds like a really good way to live. It kind of sounds like how my great grandparents lived. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when you, when you think about it like that, like humans, humans did that instinctively. It's the way yeah, they lived, you right. know, and really, and again, I'm not like saying that I never read research because I read a ton. And if you read my books, you know that there's like 700 studies cited in that heart yeah. book, you know, like yeah. I read research all the time, but like, it wasn't until, you know, this research, this entity that was research that started coming about, we were trying to discover things. It started out pure enough, I think, mm -hmm. but I think that we've really got caught in the weeds. And now you got research saying all these conflicting things. Why? because it's, you can design research in any way you want to and get the desired effect, you know? Yeah. Um, now research for discovery, like, Hey, let's test this and see what happens. Like, Oh, that's interesting. I just learned something about the natural world. That's cool. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's cool science. Right. Um, but randomized controlled trials, where you try and isolate all the factors, which is not how anything ever incurs a life. I'm all, I'm never exposed to one thing at a time. So how does that tell me anything about anything? That's right. Um, like, that type of stuff, we're really lost in the weeds with that. And what has happened since then, since we've been following that research, we've gotten sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. We've been and told sicker. that the things that we've been eating forever, saturated fat, animal foods, getting sunlight forever. We've been told those things are bad now because the research told us so, mm -hmm. um, you know, and maybe there's nefarious people behind that. I don't know. All I know is that the more you learn, the more you know, and the better you can live your life. So we've got to spread that message. We do need to spread the message. And what I, I love about your message is, is ultimately at its core, it's simple. Mm -hmm. It really is simple. So even here, I'm sitting here, I've been sitting here for an hour. I maybe just simple tip, get up and move every hour, mm -hmm. do a couple of stretches. I usually keep a, a towel nearby and I'll, you know, kind of do some arm stretches, you mm -hmm. know, shoulder back, whatever. And that's enough. It sounds like to encourage my body to make more of this structured water, which is going to protect me in the long run. Yeah. Well, and you know, you know, like sitting here in my home, like I can control a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. So I always choose to control them. So the windows open, letting natural light in, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, my feet are on a grounding mat right now. Uh, the blue light is turned way down on my screen. Um, I'm plugged in. I'm not using Wi-Fi. I'm plugged ah, in. Okay. Yeah. Plugged in. Um, I could be standing. I'm not standing right now, but if my desk does go up. I could stand. Um, and get more motion out of that, uh, just being standing and not creating this, you know, cause when we're, we're sitting, we're hunched over and that creates a lot of imbalances that impair, interfere with like uh, liquid fluid flow, like lymphatic and blood flow in the body. So, um, you can always make those little decisions, mm -hmm. you know, and they're easy. Um, and they're, you're going to be sitting there anyway, so you might as well make them, but nice you know, well. if you work in an office or something like that, then, you know, you can only control so much. Um, but you always do the best you can and you keep working toward making better changes. Um, and that's all we can really do. Um, and, you know, like I said, when you study structured water and you study like life and where we've come and uh, it's, it's fascinating how it illuminates a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, you can relate it to pretty much every chronic disease, uh, including cancer, uh, which people think is this big mystery. Um, 
But I think that you can, I mean, if you look at the research, like cancer is basically when cells lose their voltage and when they lose yeah. their voltage, they get triggered to rapidly divide. Like that, that voltage change is what triggers cell division. And so you can do it in a controlled way. You know, your body can, can create a phase transition or a, um, a voltage transition, or they call it an action potential. Um, mm -hmm. like if you learn it in normal physiology and that can trigger cell division, that's what does trigger it. However, if it happens pathologically, just like clotting, you know, it happens mm -hmm. pathologically, it becomes an issue. And when that, when your cell loses its voltage and it stays there because it's lost structured water, it'll start rapidly dividing. Um, so again, it, it explains so many things. Um, and when you lose structured water, your cell, your cells lose their shape. And that's exactly what Otto Warburg found mm -hmm. it's cancer cells. They lose yep. their shape when their mitochondria don't function. You can't build structured water. Um, they lose their shape, uh, because the structure becomes more liquid. And so they become amorphous rather mm -hmm. than this, you know, kind of, um, you know, solid state thing or, or uh, concrete thing, you know? Um, so yeah, it's pretty fascinating. You can go on and on. Yeah, you could. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm again, really geeking out about this conversation and I'm, I'm curious, um, what advice would you give? Like our oldest daughter, she lives in a big high rise, Chicago, you know, there's not a lot of grass, you know, mm -hmm. to walk on and, and again, high rise kind of inside all day. So what, what's one thing, somebody who's living that life, what could they do? to increase their structured water today? Well, the first and foremost thing is that if at all possible, which is not possible for some is move. Um, yeah. like that is, that is, if you can do that, if you can find a way to get yourself in a better situation, then do that. Um, mm -hmm. cause everything else is always going to be just things that are you're adding to, to counteract the environment that you're in. Cause it's not just like living in that you're just surrounded by wireless signals all the time, all the time. Um, yep. So, I mean, things you can do this, is where this is where it becomes more expensive. Um, if you want, if you're living in this environment, like obviously there's parks and cities, so mm -hmm. you can go. I mean, I just read a study about the negative ions in air and yeah. it's, you know, the negative ions are one thing that brings us electrical charge electrons that we can structure the water with. Um, they're much higher in a city park than they are walking down the street in the city, which would mm -hmm. make sense, but yep. they're astronomically higher, like in a waterfall in nature. Um, so get yourself in those environments as much as possible. Go to the city parks, put your feet on the earth, that kind of stuff as much as you can. Um, and then, uh, then like in your home, you can use things like I talked about, have the windows open, have natural light, turn, turn the lights off, open the windows, let in the natural light. Um, and then you can use a grounding mat, uh, for when you're just sitting around or whatever, you can use grounding sheets. Um, you can buy an EMF blocking canopy for when you sleep. You can have your bed in that canopy. And these are all, you know, somewhat pricey things, but um, well worth it if you live in a place like that, Yeah, um, you know, to, to mitigate these things. Um, right. Because you can't so, control your neighbors. And right. we, we have a Wi-Fi kill switch at night that we, we, of course, utilize. But, you know, if I lived in a high rise, you right. just have no idea what's, what's yeah, hitting your body. Yeah, above yeah. you, next to Ex you, you know, they, and they all got Wi-Fi. So they've all got Wi-Fi. So you're yeah. never going to get rid of it all. But like mm -hmm. when you're sleeping, you don't ever need it. So get yourself, you can get a canopy or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, work, work toward those types of things, you know. Um, yeah. And then like at night, you're just surrounded by light, artificial light at night. So, you know blue blocking glasses can help with that mm -hmm. um, because that will help turn on melatonin production um, when you put those on. Um, yeah. And there's definitely literature that shows that. Um, and, um, you know, maybe even blackout shades, like, you know, using um, better lighting in your, in your um, home or apartment or wherever you are, like red light or incandescent bulbs, if you can right. find them these days. Yeah. Um, those are much better options, much lower in blue because blue is what tells your body what time it is. So, yeah. Um, lots of different things that you can do to help. Um, okay. and then if you ever find the opportunity to get out of that environment, then do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. As a country girl, I've always been a country mm -hmm. girl. I feel like I have such easy access to things because I, I can walk right out into my yard. I could go out and look at the stars at night and not everybody gets that opportunity. So I just, you know, these are great tips to help make it easier for people who are yeah. living in the big city and don't, and can't move. Yeah. So yeah. that's and good. It's, and it's, and it's like, 
logical again. It like makes sense. Like we're going back as much as you can within the confines of where you are mm -hmm. in your modern day environment, go back and make things more like that natural environment. And sometimes yeah. you have to use some modern technologies that we have to do that. Yeah, love that. Well, Dr. Stephen Hesse, thank you so much. I I literally knew very little about structured water um, or fourth phase water, easy water. And now I definitely not an expert, but it it makes me excited to think about how can I incorporate some of these things into my day so that I just I make my body more resilient. Yeah, for sure. And it's again, like it's we all talk about how we're like a large percentage water. We, we mm -hmm. know we're 70, 80%, depending on what you read water, you know, but yeah. we're not, water is not just this solvent that things are floating around in and there. Like it's yeah. actually a huge part of our physiology. And it, I think it's driving our physiology and the function mm -hmm. of our body. So we need to learn about it. And so again, when I've been, as I've been learning about it, it explains so many things to me. Um, and so, you know, I explain it in detail in my books, um, all of my books and, you know, but, uh, Dr. Pollock, it's not necessarily a biological application of structured water, but you learn a lot about structured water in his book, which is the fourth phase of water. Um, so highly recommend that, um, okay. people learn about it cause it's what our world, we live on the water planet people, you know, like we need to know about this thing and Gotta figure it out. And what it can do. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, well, thank you for being such a great guest on why did I get cancer? Okay, if you've been a fan of this podcast for any length of time, you know that I can be a little bit woo-woo and then a little bit skeptical. And I think that's a really healthy place for me to be. So here's the woo-woo part. I had a podcast guest on, Dr. Henry Ely, and he told me about these grounding sheets by Ground Lux. Then I got a little bit skeptical and I read a lot of research and I thought, you know what, is this a little bit too good to be true? Because it's kind of woo-woo. I mean, I am literally taking these sheets, there's a little connector that then I've got a 15 foot cord that plugs in to an outlet. Um, so I bought them. I admit I bought them and I have to tell you, I am sleeping better. It took about a week for me to maybe get used to it. And when I say I'm plugging it in, it's not like it's an electric blanket, but the silver threads make it more grounded to the earth. So it's going to be a similar sensation inside your body. You're not going to feel anything, but to a similar sensation to walking on the grass or jumping in a lake where it just grounds you to nature and it really helps to lower uh, inflammation. Um, it helps to create more happy hormones. And for, in my case, I have noticed a difference in um, some aches and pains with my 59 year old body, but also that I'm sleeping better. Sometimes I can make it all the way through the night without waking up, which is a shocker for me. So I've jumped on the grounding sheet um, train and I'm really enjoying it. So I want to tell you about it. And I want to tell you about this kind of crazy special that they have, but it's a time sensitive one um, because once they run out, they, they're telling me that it has to be over. Um, so through the end of September or until supplies run out, if you use the code free Matt Deborah, you can get a free twin sleep mattress pad that just goes under any kind of a sheet um, and is going to do the same type of grounding. It's a $150 value and you get that for free if you order $200 worth of their product. Um, they're also telling me you can stack any kind of codes on top of it and get discounts, you, but it just, you have to hit that 200 point to be able to get the free sleep mat. Um, so again, ground Lux, I've got all the link in the show notes, then use the code free mat Deborah to get your free grounding sleep mat, which I'm actually going to do because we have a spare bedroom and I want to have one on there too for guests. So, um, groundlux.com. Enjoy. Hey y'all, can you do me a favor today and go and leave a review of this podcast? I know that the more great reviews, wink, wink, emphasis on great <laughs> reviews that I get along with more downloads and more subscribers that pushes this podcast out to people who might normally not even find it. And the reason I started this podcast and my real heart for starting this podcast is that I needed this information. It wasn't available. And so I started a podcast so that I could be a blessing to others. 
So you're a blessing to me just by being here. And again, thank you for your support. Thank you for your positive reviews and all of the notes that you send me. And also just want to say, hey, keep in mind, I'm not a doctor. And if you need medical advice, please reach out to your team. That is going to be just the best source for you because they know you. So again, I hope you enjoy this podcast.